night, mysterious deaths. Thai PM orders investigation into deaths of six foreign nationals in Bangkok Hotel amid poisoning findings, dismissing shooting claims. Maritime exercises. China and Russia conduct joint naval drills amid strengthened military and trade alliances, defying US sanctions in South China Sea. Foreign interference. Biden administration alerts on an Iranian plot on Trump, increases security amid unrelated assassination attempt investigation. Animal lover. Woman creates haven for Yemen's stray animals amid adversity, nurtures hope and care in Sana. All that and more as World is Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. Today we delve deep into the current affairs of global affairs. Our top story focuses on the mysterious deaths that happened in Thailand. Six people, including two Vietnamese Americans, were found dead at the Grand Hyatt Erawan in Bangkok due to cyanide poisoning. The victims, including two with American citizenship, were discovered by a hotel worker and had been dead for at least 24 hours. Thai police are investigating the deaths of six foreign nationals whose bodies were found in a room in a Hyatt hotel in Bangkok on Tuesday. They are looking for a seventh person in connection with the incident. All six were of Vietnamese descent, including two Americans. Police believe they may have ingested something that killed them and that they were not the victims of robbery or assault. Initially from the scene inspection, there was no fight, no harm done. The property, as far as we can see, has not been ransacked. It is assumed that there was no intention toward the property and no outsiders entered, as determined from the fingerprint investigation. It is possible that it occurred from the inside, possibly a hideout, which indeed originated from the inside. The U.S. State Department said Tuesday that it is monitoring the situation. Whenever a U.S. citizen dies in a foreign country, uh, local authorities are responsible for determining the cause of death. Thailand Prime Minister Soita Taiwasin, who visited the hotel on Tuesday, has ordered a swift investigation. His office said he was concerned about the impact on tourism. It's the key driver for the country's economy. Last year, 28 million visitors spent nearly $34 billion in Thailand. The tourism sector was shaken in October by a shooting spree at a luxury shopping mall close to the Hyatt, in which two foreigners were killed. Heading over to our neighboring Bangladesh, at least five were killed and many injured in Bangladesh as students clashed with government supporters and police over job quotas. Tens of thousands protested nationwide against Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government amid high youth unemployment. Five people were killed and many injured in Bangladesh as clashes erupted between government supporters and police against students protesting a job quota system. Thousands of students nationwide protested for a second day, a significant challenge to Prime Minister Sheikh Kashina's four-term government. The protests center on job quotas, including a controversial 30% allocation for freedom fighter family members amid youth unemployment. Riot police used rubber bullets and tear gas to control the unrest, which turned violent in some areas like Rangpur and Chittagong. The situation remains tense with police deployed at university campuses across the country. Moving on to East Asia, South Korea's spy agency confirmed that a senior North Korean diplomat based in Cuba has defected to South Korea. This defection involving a North Korean Councillor of Political Affairs likely impacts Kim Jong-un's efforts to strengthen his leadership. A senior North Korean diplomat based in Cuba defected to the South last November. On Tuesday, the National Intelligence Service said the media reports on the defection of a North Korean counselor of political affairs in Cuba were factual. The NIS gave no further details. A South Korean newspaper, the Joseon Ilbo, reported early Tuesday that 52-year-old Lee Il-gyu fled to the south with his wife and children. Lee, a leading expert on relations with Cuba, reportedly left around the time South Korea was actively communicating with Cuba ahead of establishing diplomatic ties in February. He told the paper any North Korean resident would think of wanting to live in South Korea at least once, adding that he felt irritation with the North Korean regime, pessimism about the future, and desire to escape these as his motivation for fleeing. 
Lee's defection made headlines as he is one of the highest ranking North Korean diplomats made public to have defected in recent years. The acting ambassadors to Italy and Kuwait defected in 2019, while the defection by Taeyong-ho, the former deputy ambassador to the UK in 2016, remains that of the highest-ranked diplomat to come to the South. Pundits say the continued defections of senior North Korean diplomats indicate that members of the elite in the North are becoming increasingly disillusioned with the Kim Jong-un regime. Their situation of being stationed abroad could also make it easier for them to defect. China and Russia have continued their naval drills as they began live fire naval exercises in the South China Sea, strengthening their military and trade ties. The Maritime Cooperation 2024 exercise includes joint air defense and anti submarine drills involving the Russian Pacific Fleet and PLA Navy. The joint patrol aims to deepen cooperation in various fields, enhancing their ability to respond to maritime security threats. Wang Guangzheng of the PLA Navy Southern Theater noted that the patrol strengthened practical cooperation between China and Russia in various areas. He highlighted that it bolstered their capability to respond jointly to maritime security threats. According to a PLA Navy statement, the participating vessels departed from Zhangjiang Naval Port in Guangdong Province on July 15. Gu Wenggui, an exiled Chinese businessman, was convicted in the U.S. on charges of stealing millions from online followers. Convicted on 9 of 12 counts, including racketeering and wire fraud, he faces decades in prison, as sentencing is set for November 19th. Guo Wengui, an exiled Chinese businessman and vocal critic of Beijing, has been convicted in the U.S. of stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from online followers. Jailed since March 2023, Guo's convictions ranged from racketeering conspiracy to wire fraud. His seven-week trial ended Tuesday. Federal prosecutors in Manhattan alleged Guo raised over $1 billion through fraudulent investment and cryptocurrency schemes from 2018 to 2023. Guo reportedly told his followers some of the investment would go to a challenging China's government. Prosecutors say Guo instead spent the money on luxury goods, including a New Jersey mansion, a red Lamborghini, and a yacht. His defense tried to portray Guo, a former real estate mogul, as an ardent dissident who flaunted his wealth as part of his critique of the Chinese Communist Party. Guo is said to be sentenced in November and could face decades in prison. He attracted allies such as Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's one-time advisor during his presidency, Bannon was arrested on Guo's yacht in 2020 in an unrelated fraud case and was later pardoned by Trump. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Tonight on the road to the White House, former rivals Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis endorsed Donald Trump at the Republican convention days after an assassination attempt. Haley, who had criticized Trump, urged supporters to vote for him over Biden, emphasizing unity for the nation's sake. Donald Trump has my strong endorsement, period. Donald Trump's former rivals for the Republican presidential nomination came together to endorse his candidacy at the party's convention on Tuesday in a strong display of unity three days after the former president survived an assassination attempt. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley had described Trump as unfit for office during her campaign, but on day two of the convention, she urged her supporters to back him over Democratic President Joe Biden for the sake of our nation. You don't have to agree with Trump 100% of the time to vote for him. While conservative Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, among the last to stay in the nomination race against Trump, spoke proudly of his state's strong support for the party. Due to bold leadership, the Democratic Party lies in ruins. The left is in retreat. Freedom reigns supreme. The woke mind virus is dead. And Florida is a solid Republican state. 
Trump applauded alongside his running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, who was himself formerly a fierce Trump critic, once even comparing him to Hitler. If you want to make America great again. The show of group harmony appeared to be aimed at contrasting with the Democratic Party, which is divided over whether 81-year-old Biden should drop his re-election bid amid fresh questions about his mental acuity. Trump, Trump, baby. When it came to policy, the evening speeches took on an angrier tone. Many were centered on the theme of law and order and infused with Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric. The former president's daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, who co-chairs the Republican National Committee, then closed the night with a shift in tone. We, as Americans, must always remember, there is more that unites us than divides us. However, following Saturday's assassination attempt, voter fears about the polarized state of the nation appear to have deepened. Ipsos poll released on Tuesday found that 80% of voters, with similar shares among Republicans and Democrats, agreed the country is spiraling out of control in the wake of the shooting. The U.S. received intelligence from a human source about an Iranian plot to kill Donald Trump before the recent assassination attempt. While security measures were heightened, officials clarified that there was no known connection between this plot and the 20-year-old assailant. Tonight, a new report that security around Donald Trump was increased in recent weeks because U.S. intelligence learned of an Iranian plot to kill him, according to three officials briefed on the matter, raising even more questions about how a 20-year-old gunman in rural Pennsylvania with no apparent connection to the Iranian plot was able to get on a rooftop last Saturday and open fire on the former president. Moments before Thomas Crooks targeted the podium, a Butler Township police officer locked eyes with him, according to township manager Tom Knights. He was able to pull his head up over the roof. Um, he did, in fact, see an individual on the roof with a weapon. The officer was responding to a report that someone suspicious was on the roof. Fellow officers boosting him up to check it out. Turned towards him, um, had the barrel of his weapon pointed at the officer. Knight says the officers radioed a message on a channel that included the Secret Service to say the suspicious person was in fact a gunman. He does not know how much time passed before the shooter opened fire. This new video showing the moments after Secret Service tackled the former president to protect him. The Butler Township police were not responsible for the security of the building, according to Knight, but it's unclear which local agency was. The Secret Service says it was outside of their security perimeter and was primarily the responsibility of local law enforcement, even though the rooftop had a vantage point 148 yards from the podium. The AR-15, or variations, the M4, has a maximum effective range of 656 yards. Retired Secret Service agent Rich Staropoli also worked for the Department of Homeland Security under Trump. That building was nowhere near the outer perimeter. There is no excuse for not having someone posted on the roof of that building. The Secret Service tells ABC News that no one was put on the roof because it was dangerously sloped. That argument called into question because of images like these. The Secret Service putting out a statement on X overnight. We are deeply grateful to the officers who ran towards danger to locate the gunman and to all our local partners for their unwavering commitment. Heading over to the Ukraine conflict amid Ukraine's severe heat wave, residents face hardships exacerbated by power outages from Russian airstrikes. With temperatures soaring to record highs, daily life is disrupted as essential services like refrigeration and air conditioning become unreliable. By torchlight, Ukrainian mother Margarita Zakarchuk carries her child up to her 12th floor apartment. The lift is out due to a blackout. She is one of millions of Ukrainians struggling amid a record heat wave, compounded by regular power cuts making air conditioning units and refrigerators useless. Regular Russian airstrikes have ravaged the country's energy system, leading to hours-long rolling blackouts. 
The Central Geophysical Observatory said on Tuesday it had clocked a record high 93.5 degrees Fahrenheit in Kyiv for July 15. Temperatures on Tuesday were expected to reach even higher. Store owners like Victoria battle increased costs from running generators and product losses. Ukraine's broader economy is also struggling in the heat. State weather forecasters say the harvest of late crops could decline by up to 30% in central, southern and eastern regions. The energy minister has urged consumers to conserve energy and minimise the use of powerful electrical appliances to preserve the grid. Taking a closer look at the ongoing conflict in Gaza, bulldozers work through mounds of waste amidst a deepening sanitisation crisis exacerbated by the conflict. Displaced residents voice distress over dire living conditions, scarce essentials, mounting garbage and health hazards. Bulldozers plough through piles and piles of waste as residents in Han Yunus watch on. This worsening sanitation crisis is increasing the risk of disease spreading and deepening the misery of those living through the war raging in Gaza. The waste lines streets which have been reduced to rubble during the conflict between Israel and Palestinian militant group Hamas. Since October, Palestinians have faced Israeli airstrikes, shelling and ground offensives. They're also crippled by shortages of water, food, fuel, medicine and a lack of functioning hospitals. And in what is one of the world's most densely populated places, there is now an ever-increasing mountain of garbage. But calling for government services to help is wishful thinking, as nine months of war have caused $200 million worth of damage to critical infrastructure like sewage systems and waste trucks, with the situation exacerbated by a lack of fuel, which is needed to operate the cleaning and sewage systems. Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, killing 1,200 people and taking about 250 people hostage, according to Israeli tallies. Israel responded with an offensive that's killed more than 38,000 people, according to Gaza health authorities. Heading over to France, French centrist Prime Minister Gabriel Attal and his government resigned, remaining in a caretaker capacity until a new cabinet was appointed after an inconclusive snap election. The caretaker government will manage current affairs in France but cannot pass new laws or implement significant changes. Smiling wide, Gabriel Attal left the cabinet meeting relieved of most of his duties, and so did his government. After President Emmanuel Macron accepted his prime minister's resignation on Tuesday, France is now being run by a caretaker government with limited powers. Attal sought to reassure the French, saying he and his ministers had prepared for the upcoming Olympic and Paralympic Games in advance. If there's a crisis, obviously, the government can take all the decisions and measures necessary to protect the French people, public order and security. What we cannot do, on the other hand, is take new political initiatives, initiate reforms, submit a bill. That's not possible. In past examples, French caretaker governments have only lasted a matter of days. It's unclear how long this one will stay in place. The country plunged into political uncertainty after parliamentary elections on July 7. In a statement, the Elysee Palace said, for this period to come to an end as quickly as possible, it's up to Republican forces to work together to build unity, referring to mainstream political parties, but excluding the far-right National Rally and far-left France Unbowed. The latter makes up part of the four-party alliance, the New Popular Front, which won the most seats in Parliament, though not enough for a majority. Since the elections, the left has been scrambling to find a consensus candidate for prime minister. On Monday, France Unbowed suspended negotiations with its partners, accusing the socialists of vetoing anyone they put forward. According to France Unbowed head Manuel Bompard, the new popular front has instead agreed upon a candidate for National Assembly president. After the chamber allocates this and other top jobs on Thursday, he said talks would resume on finding a candidate for prime minister. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. 
An animal lover in Sanaa, Yemen, established a shelter two years ago for stray cats and dogs. Despite financial challenges, she provides food, medicine and care to dozens of animals, aiming to give them a safe haven and rehabilitation. Maha, an animal lover based in Sanaa, Yemen, spends her days caring for stray cats and dogs. Two years ago, she founded a makeshift shelter to provide a safe haven and medical treatment for these animals. Despite facing challenges like the high cost of food and medicine, Maha remained dedicated to her cause. Her sanctuary offers vital health and rehabilitation services to dozens of abandoned and injured animals in the city. And that concludes our World News Roundup for this evening. We we'll return tomorrow with more vital updates from around the globe. Stay tuned as I'll be returning with a nightly business report. Thank you for watching. See you soon.